Welcome. We are going to be talking about enols and enolates and reactions at the enolate carbon, basically. Um, let me introduce a little bit about what this uh, thing means, enols and enolates. So uh, first, what we're going to be able to uh, do in future reactions is take um, acetone, maybe different types of ketones and uh, aldehydes, and perform uh, substitution reactions on them with a base or acid catalyst, okay, and some kind of electrophile. So there's a lot of detail here, but I'll just write E plus for the electrophile, okay? And what you get here is a molecule where you substitute the hydrogen for uh, some group. So it's kind of like uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution, if you want to think about it that way, or uh, radical halogenation, that's a substitution reaction. So this uh, occurs through ionic intermediates. Now, one of the intermediates we're gonna be talking about is called an enol, okay? An enol has this very specific structure, okay? It looks like an alkene, and it looks like an alcohol. This intermediate is extremely important and so we abbreviate it enol, okay? So enol is short for alkene and alcohol. The enolate is very similarly related, except it looks like the, kind of like alkoxide, okay? So this is called the enolate, okay? The enolate or the enolate ion. Now, when you have carbonyl containing compounds, Okay, we uh, abbreviate carbons outside of things from the carbonyl based on the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and gamma. So if we look at this carbon right here, we call this the carbonyl carbon. There's no special name we have for that that we've introduced, okay? So we just call it the carbonyl carbon, okay? Now, one carbon out from that, we call that the alpha carbon. The second carbon away from that we call the beta carbon, and the third carbon away from that we call the gamma, okay? Same thing if we go on the other side of the ring. This is an alpha carbon. This here is a beta carbon, and yes, we call that the alpha carbon, okay? So alpha carbons are next to the carbonyl carbon, and so this right here is a reaction where we substitute an alpha hydrogen for another group, like a bromine, a chlorine, a carbon atom, uh, some other stuff, okay? Now, I need to introduce you the concept of uh, tautomers, okay? Tautomers are two uh, structures that differ in the position of a pi bond and a hydrogen, okay? Now, we've talked previously about resonance structures and how resonance structures only differ in the position of a pi bond, okay? So, for example, uh, let, let's make this something, you know, unique or different here. So, let's uh, talk about uh, this molecule here, okay? So, we've got a pi bond between the C and the O. And this arrow right here is reserved for resonance, okay? And if we draw the resonance structure that we get from this, if we uh, move these uh, p orbital electrons on the nitrogen over there and move these pi bonding electrons up to the oxygen, we'll get a resonance structure, okay? And uh, remember that resonance maintains the exact same number of bonds, okay? 
There's no uh, pi bonds or sigma bonds that are broken or rearranged here. The only thing that looks different are the positions of the electrons, okay? Tautomers, in contrast, have um, a difference here in where a hydrogen atom is bonded, okay? It might be bonded to carbon in one structure and oxygen in another structure. So they are technically constitutional isomers because they differ in their constitution or connectivity. Let's take a look at acetone as a simple example here. I'm not going to draw all the hydrogens in here on the acetone molecule, but uh, this is called the keto, the keto form of um, acetone, okay? And it's generally the most uh, stable, so we need to draw that arrow bigger. And we could draw a tautomer that looks like this, okay? So here, what's going on? Well, you can see that the position of the pi bond is different. Here we have a carbon-oxygen pi bond, and here we have a carbon-carbon pi bond, okay? Here we have a CH bond, okay? And here we have an OH bond, okay? So that's a difference in a uh, position of the hydrogen atom as well as the pi bond. So this is the enol form here, okay? These are constitutional isomers that are in equilibrium. They can go backwards and forwards to one another if it's under acidic condition or basic conditions. So the process by which this happens is called tautomerization. Okay, and I'll just point an arrow to the equilibrium. It means the process of going back and forth. We call that interconversion. Now there's different kinds of tautomers, but in organic chemistry here, we just need to concern ourselves with our ketones and um, aldehydes, that's it, okay? So that's a little bit of uh, information there. Now, if we look at the position of this equilibrium, what's experimentally found here is that you have greater than 99.99% of the ketone and virtually none of the um, enol form, okay? So the keto form or the ketone form is the most stable uh, tautomer, okay? Now, if we look at a 1,3 diketone, we call this a 1,3 diketone because there's a carbonyl at carbon 1, and a carbonyl at carbon-3. Okay. So this is an example of a 1,3-diketone. They can be cyclic and have more interesting structures. Now in this case, when a tautomer is formed, you get uh, this structure here. Okay, and there's a number of things about this product here, the, the tautomer on the right, that uh, makes it more stable. So first of all, when you have uh, more pi bonds next to each other, we call this situation conjugated, okay?
This means that there's more state they're more stable because there's opportunity for resonance. We've talked about 1,3-butadiene and how it's going to be more stable because of conjugation than say 1,4-pentadiene. So the more double bonds you have right next to each other, it's going to be more stable because you have opportunity for resonance. The other feature that makes this molecule on the right or tautomer on the right is more stable is a hydrogen bond, okay? A hydrogen bond is a bond. It's worth a certain amount of energy, and it stabilizes this uh, molecule, okay? So stabilize by a hydrogen bonding, okay? This is a stabilizing hydrogen bond, okay? So is that worth three, you know, uh, one and a half kilojoules or something? I don't know what it's worth. It depends on the, you know, the structure and the solvent and things like that, but uh, it's going to help stabilize the molecule on the right. What is observed here is that you have between 70, 70 to 90 percent of the enol form here, and you have very little of the uh, diketone form, okay? okay? So the ketone form is not always the most stable. Another obvious example uh, is in the case of phenol. We always draw phenol like this. Okay, and if we focus in on the key street uh, key uh, feature here, we can see that there's a double bond. Okay, and there's a hydroxyl group, you know, right attached to the double bond. Okay, and we can draw a tautomer of this structure that has a double bond here, and you know, we place the extra hydrogen uh, on this position there. Okay, and so that structure is not going to be stable because it's not aromatic. Okay. So this enol tautomer is aromatic. Remember that it satisfies Huckel's rule of having 4n plus 2 pi electrons in the cyclic system. And this here is not completely conjugated in a cyclic fashion. Okay, So the molecule on the left, phenol, is normally what we draw. So that's the enol form being more stable. And, if, and of course, this can't really be detected. You can't really detect that in a mixture of phenol, okay? Now, there are a couple different ways that a tautomer can tautomerize to form the other tautomer, okay? And so the first thing we want to talk about here is acid-catalyzed tautomerization. Okay, and so I'll just pick on, I don't know, cyclohexanone, and we'll try to explain how, you know, in acid catalysis or under acid conditions, you possibly could show formation of the enol, okay? So let's go ahead and work uh, through this procedure. The first step, you're going to have protonation of the carbonyl oxygen. Recall again that I taught you, if you have H+, plus, you use that in the first step of your mechanism. Okay? So P stands for protonation here. We are going to form a protonated ketone. Now this is done in water usually, okay? An aqueous solvent, methanol or ethanol, which are two protic solvents, okay? And that's the key feature here. You need a protic solvent for this to occur. Now, what we want to do is draw in that hydrogen. And we can now draw water as a reaction solvent. Deprotonating to give you the enol structure. Okay. And so that's D for deprotonation. So that's a two-step procedure, protonation, then deprotonation. Love and learn that curved arrow reaction mechanism. Okay? Let's talk about base catalyzed tar Oh, and by the way, you should be able to show re uh, curved arrow reaction mechanisms to go from the enol to the ketone. And the second thing I want to point out here uh, is a base catalyzed tautomerization.
the idea here is that we can take um, cyclohexanone and somehow show that under hydroxide and aqueous, right, which is a protic solvent, aqueous conditions, you can possibly form um, thienol as well. So how do we show this? Well, we take our ketone and we need to indicate the alpha hydrogen. So remember again, we call that the alpha hydrogen. And we wanna show a hydroxide here as a base that can deprotonate that hydrogen, okay? Now we'll talk a little bit more in the future about the acidity of alpha hydrogens, but for now, just assume that it might be acidic and deprotonate, okay, at the alpha carbon. Why might this reaction deprotonate the alpha carbon? The main reason is because we have a resonance stabilized carbanion. This carbanion is conjugated, it's next to this uh, pi bond, and so the electrons can be uh, swooping up to the carbonyl oxygen, and we can show a resonance structure. If you wanna label this as an individual step, you can call it R for resonance. Anyways, we draw the uh, negative charge up here, and we draw the double bond now between those two carbons. This structure is called the enolate, the enolate ion. Okay, this is the enol, right? We call this the ketone. So these uh, names you should be very familiar with. And now that we have this alkoxide looking thing, we've done this before, we can go ahead and attack uh, water, right? In this process, what we do is we protonate we protonate the carbon, we protonate the oxygen, okay? So we get the neutral enol. So it's deprotonation and then protonation. If you need to show the resonance as one step, you can do that, okay? So those three steps is what you need to do, okay? So those are the two processes by which you can interconvert a ketone and an enol under acidic conditions or uh, basic conditions, okay? Now, what the enol can do is um, attack things because it's a, uh, a nucleophile, okay? So you have two basic types of reactions here. Um, let me show you how uh, enolates can, can react. Okay, so what we can do is uh, show how this enolate is a nucleophile, okay? And it can attack an electrophile, okay? Because there's lone pairs on the oxygen, there's a negative charge on the oxygen, it's possible to get um, an attack involving the oxygen atom, okay? And this is more rare. Uh, it happens in a couple of reactions, we'll see. But most often what we have is um, the carbon acting as a nucleophile, okay? So remember again that we can draw the enolate that exists as a negative charge on the carbon, okay? And what we more likely have is attack on the carbon, okay? to give us introduction of an electrophile at the alpha carbon, okay? So we end up getting an electrophile introduced at the alpha carbon, okay? So um, you wanna think about these enolates as being nucleophiles that are going to attack electrophiles, okay? Now, how do you know which hydrogens are going to be removed? As I mentioned, the acidity is based on um, resonance, conjugation, and possibly hydrogen bonding. Now, resonance and conjugation are only going to occur if 
you pull off the hydrogen or deprotonate the alpha carbon, okay? So these hydrogens right here are at the alpha position. These are going to be your acidic hydrogens, okay? The hydrogens attached to the beta carbon are not, and the hydrogens attached to gamma carbons are not, okay? So if you treat this with a base, you're gonna selectively deprotonate the alpha carbons, you're gonna make the enolate, and then that's going to go ahead and attack whatever electrophile you have um, in, in solution, okay? So, um, there's, some, there's some practice about that here on page, uh, well, problem 22.4. It says, draw both resonance structures of the enolate formed when each of the following ketones is treated with a strong base. Let's do that problem. All right, so when we do this problem, you want to think through carefully what is actually going on, okay? So how do you make the enolate? You make the enolate by reacting ketones or aldehydes with uh, hydroxide. So grab hydroxide, point an arrow to the hydrogen, and then point an arrow to the carbon, and this will make the carbon-centered enolate. That is to say, the negative charge is going to be on the carbon atom. Okay? We can also draw a resonance structure of this by moving it in, pushing it up to the oxygen of the carbonyl. And this is what we call a, an oxygen-centered enolate. Okay? So this is a resonance. This first one is an equilibrium. And here, we're going to draw the uh, double bond between the two carbons and a negative charge on this um, oxygen atom, okay? Let's do the same thing for part B. So again, draw your hydrogen there. Draw through the mechanism, okay, to gain additional practice. Point the electrons to the carbon, and that's going to form the carbon-centered enolate. I should mention that the carbon on the right, this alpha carbon on the right, has no hydrogens. There's four bonds occupied by carbon atoms. So the only alpha carbon that can be deprotonated is the one on the left. And then we go ahead and show the resonance structure that can result from that using curved arrows. It's great and it's a good idea to use curved arrows to draw resonance structures. Okay, so that would be the resonance structure of the enolate. In this molecule C, once again, we have a quaternary carbon that has no hydrogen atoms, and so we want to deprotonate on the left. So draw your hydrogen, take hydroxide, point the arrows directly to the carbon atom. Okay, in this equilibrium atom uh, reaction, we're going to form a negative charge on the carbon atom. Next, to show the resonance structure, show how that negative charge can be delocalized and pushed up to the oxygen, the carbonyl oxygen. And that resonance structure is going to be right here. Okay? In this next structure, D, remember again that this carbon has four bonds to it. There's no hydrogens on that dotted carbon. So there is here. So let's draw hydrogen here. Hydroxide can deprotonate. Draw that um, negative charge going to the carbon. Okay. So this is your carbon-centered enolate. Now to draw the resonance structure, draw the lone pairs on that carbon coming in, pushing up to the oxygen, and that will form your oxygen-centered enolate. I would expect this structure to be a little bit more stable than a normal ketone because you have uh, an additional conjugation situation where you have all those double bonds in the benzene ring or the phenyl ring conjugated to the alkene. Um, kind of running out of space here, but we'll try to squeeze it in. Um, this right here is called the aldehydic hydrogen. The aldehydic hydrogen is not acidic because it's directly attached 
to the pi bond, okay? You want a negative charge adjacent to a pi bond in order for it to be deprotonated. So this is adjacent to the pi bond. Hydroxide will deprotonate the alpha carbon. Draw those electrons pointing to the carbon atom. I'll go this way, I guess. And what we have is the carbon-centered enolate of an aldehyde. This negative charge, right, can also reform a carbon carbon pi bond, and that's going to be um, why am I using resonance? I mean, I'm supposed to use a resonance arrow here. Okay. Double bond there. Okay. So that will make this structure here. Okay. So that's problem 22.4. It's just basics, you know, draw the enolate, being able to draw the enol, being able to draw both of the tautomers or the resonance structures, you know, be familiar with those sorts of things. Okay. Um, now, oftentimes when we are making the enolate, we use a, a product solvent, but not always. And there's a table 22.1 in your textbook that discusses the pKa's of these various things. So acetone, for example, has a pKa of 19.2, okay? And that's for this hydrogen that's on the alpha carbon. Acetophenone, has a pKa of 18.3. Okay. Now remember, if you have a lower pKa, it means more acidic. 18.3 and 19.2 differ in about one pKa unit, which means that acetophenone is about 10 times as acidic as acetone. Why is that? As I alluded to on the previous slide, it's because the double bond you form when you make the enolate or the enol is going to be in conjugation with all those double bonds in the phenyl ring, making it unusually more stable than it otherwise would be. Aldehydes, remember, are generally speaking more reactive towards nucleophiles, and in this case, they're also going to be more acidic, okay? So an aldehyde, for example, has a pKa of uh, 16.7. That's about 100 times more acidic than the acetophenone and about a thousand times more acidic than the acetone, okay? So aldehydes are going to be the most acidic, maybe things that have conjugation or some kind of hydrogen bonding or other kind of means of stability, followed by just ordinary ketones at the last, okay? Now, your position of equilibrium is generally always going to form uh, favor the ketone form, okay? Now, we generally use uh, alkoxides to make the enolates. So if we have acetone, okay, as I said previously, the pKa here is about equal to 18 point, uh, I'm sorry, 19.2, okay? And when we treat this with ethoxide, okay, so typical bases might be sodium methoxide sodium ethoxide, you know, things like that, alkoxides, they're going to deprotonate, as we mentioned, and you'll, you'll make the, uh, the enolate, okay? Now, generally, we show uh, the enolate as being the oxygen-centered enolate because, as you might expect, oxygen is a more electronegative atom, and it's more happy or stable with the negative charge on the oxygen atom. Okay, now to figure out the position of this equilibrium, you need to label the pKa of both the acids. The acid on the left is called acetone, it has a pKa of 19.2, and the pKa of ethanol, it has a pKa of 15.9. Okay, to figure out the position of this equilibrium, you can do a little bit of shortcut here. You can do 10 to the power of the difference in the pKa's. Okay. So the pKa on the right is 15.9, pKa on the left is 19.2, okay? And it's going to be 10 to the minus 3 or something like that, okay? 
So it means it favors the 10 to the minus 3 as an equilibrium constant means you much more favor the starting materials, okay? But you might have 1% or 0.1% of, of this uh, in solution, okay? Um, another way to... Um, cause the reaction to be uh, pushed all the way to the right, if you really want it to go, is use um, lithium diisopropyl amide, okay? I'll show you how this works, what it is, and everything, but what you need to remember is that LDA is a very strong base. Very strong, okay? The way it's normally made is you take diisopropylamine, okay, and you treat this with uh, butyl lithium. What is butyl? Butyl, remember lithium is a lithium, okay, and this is going to be, it's much like a green yard. Okay, so this is a butyl. And this is going to act as a strong base, deprotonate this, and you make lithium diisopropyl amide. Now, don't worry, we don't ever have to draw this really. Okay, so this is called lithium diisopropyl. Amide. Now, it's very strange for students to hear that amide word at the end there because it's not an amide. It's just a deprotonated amine. But remember, sodium amide is NaNH2. Okay? So hopefully by me showing you that, you're like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Okay? Now, LDA is a very strong base, so if we want to uh, take, for example, an aldehyde, which we said before, uh, acetaldehyde has a pKa of 16.7, and we want to treat this with uh, LDA, we will make the enolate, okay? Technically, there's a lithium salt in there. I'll just write Li+. Plus. And the byproduct you form from this is diisopropylamine. Diisopropylamine has a very high pKa of 36. Okay? So you can see that the equilibrium constant, do you see that small little arrow going backwards? The equilibrium constant is heavily favored towards the right because the equilibrium constant for this reaction, if we use the trick, it's going to be the pKa on the right, which is 36, subtracted from 16.7, and it's going to be like 10 to the 19th or 10 to the 20th, which is a bazillion, okay? So the equilibrium constant is very big. That means it favors the products on the right, okay? So LDA really pushes this uh, to the right, okay? In other cases, we have a ketone that's sufficiently acidic, so that reaction occurs quite readily. 1,3-diketones we talked about before are very acidic because there's more conjugation. There's um, hydrogen bond that stabilizes the um, enolate structure or the enol structure, I mean. And then also uh, there's additional, uh, additional opportunity for resonance, okay? So if I treat this with sodium ethoxide, This can deprotonate a hydrogen, and what you make is um, an enolate here. Okay, so this is the enolate. It's a carbon-centered enolate, and you form uh, ethanol. Remember that ethanol has a pKa of 15.9. Okay, and if we want to do that little trick here, I forgot to wrote, write the pKa. The pKa here is 9 for the diketone. The equilibrium constant is going to be uh, 10 to the power 
15.9 minus 9. So, you know, that's like 7. Okay, 10 to the 7th is like 10 million, right? So the products are very heavily favored. So let's make this arrow really, really, really bold to indicate that the products are very favored, okay? Now, this structure here, you should be uh, comfortable drawing curved arrows to show how um, this guy here is in resonance with this enolate, which is conjugated. And it's also in resonance with this enolate, which is also conjugated, okay? The more resonance structures you have generally, the more stable that substance is. So 1,3-diketones are unusually acidic, and a simple sodium methoxide or sodium ethoxide can deprotonate those and give you the enolates. Okay, so definitely keep an eye out uh, for those, okay? Um, how about let's do problem uh, 22.6. Okay, so problem 22.6 says draw the enolate ion, okay? So we want to draw the enolate ion. When each of the following compounds is treated with sodium ethoxide, okay? In each case, draw all resonance structures of the enolate ion and predict whether a substantial amount of starting ketone will be present together with the enolate at equilibrium, okay? So this hydrogen, this hydrogen, and this hydrogen are all gonna be alpha to a carbonyl carbon, but the one on top is adjacent to two alpha, two uh, carbonyl carbons, so that one is going to be the most acidic, okay? And we talked about 1,3-diketones, how they have an acidity of about pK9, so it means that the enolate is going to be most favored, okay? We can draw the enolate like this, and this is going to be more favored at equilibrium than the starting ketone because sodium methoxide is a very, very, very strong base in consideration of that acidic proton. Now, resonance structures can be drawn for this that show the oxygen-centered enolate on the left or an oxygen-centered enolate on the right. Okay, so those are the two enolate structures you can draw. Now, um, this guy here is not a 1,3 diketone. It's a 1,4 diketone. So we just pick one of these. There's a plane of symmetry here. There's a plane of symmetry here. We just grab one of them, and we deprotonate, and we realize that an ordinary ketone, you know, if we look at acetone as an example of an ordinary ketone, that's going to have a pKa of about 19, ketones aren't going to deprotonate sufficiently or to a large extent with sodium ethoxide. So this is going to be the most uh, stable form at equilibrium. But if we've got to draw an, an alkoxide, which is what the, if we have to draw an enolate, which is what the question is asking, we would draw an enolate like that, which can be in resonance stabilization with the carbon-centered enolate, which is that structure there. Okay. So I think you're getting an idea, you know, for how, how to do this, okay? So that's A and uh, B, all right? So uh, that's it for this uh, section. I hope this gets you started with the introduction. Thanks for watching, and please consider subscribing.